uh, you know, the last chapter moved really fast because, you know, we had, there were some points to cover, but really, like, we've already laid such a foundation for a lot of the theological stuff that we've already discussed. A lot, I mean, there's not going to be too much, not even in this chapter per se. Um, there'll be some questions maybe about timing and so, but really, like, like 19 is, is a chapter of rejoicing. We're getting into the marriage of the Lamb, the coming of Christ, um, doom of the beast and the false prophet, just reading some of the headings. Um, and so it's really, I mean, most of it's pretty cut and dry, pretty straightforward. Um, we are leaving some of the imagery, the Babylon imagery, and moving into uh, really kind of like what we saw Prior to, I mean, this is this is almost like chapter 5. 4 and 5, where we have the scene in heaven, the throne, and the worship of the, um, of the Creator. And then Jesus taking the scroll. So we're getting into a worship session here. So, um, so it's exciting nonetheless, because Babylon has fallen. And we're reaching the culmination of all things. So, still pretty exciting. Just in a different way, right? So, all right, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we will jump right in. Lord God, thank you for another evening to come together in your name to study your word to read over this vision that you've given your servant John, that 2,000 years later that we can still be challenged, that we can be refined by it, that we can be called to refocus on you. And how we need to orient our lives around you. Father, the things, as we've moved through so much material and, and death and destruction, that here as we come into this portion of the vision, help us to be inspired. That deep down in our hearts, in our minds, that you would just restore joy and hope regardless of whatever else is going on in our lives, that we would be found right at your feet, worshiping you. That as we get into the essence of the hope that we have in the future to come, and that you have spoke it 2,000 years ago, that it is set in stone, that these are the things that are going to happen that that is what that we have, have put eternity on the line for. And we praise you, we thank you for how you've worked all of these things for your glory. And that you still do the same in our lives, individually and collectively as a fellowship. To you be the glory, now and forever. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, picking up with 19 here. So, we read through it last time and uh, just kind of ended, you know, with that reading. But I want to kick off with Mount here as just kind of an introduction into 19. So in response to the admonition of chapter 18, verse 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her, against Babylon. So now in response to that comes the hallelujah chorus of chapter 19, verse 1. 
The first five verses of chapter 19 constitute a fitting climax for the lengthy section on the fall of Rome, which began at chapter 17, verse 1. The heavenly jubilation breaks out in marked contrast to the solemn dirges of the kings, merchants, and seafarers whose economic empires collapsed with the devastation of the imperial capital. So imagine, like, we just went through these dirges, these funeral songs, and now we move into the hallelujah chorus, right? So this is, I mean, for, for a few chapters, we have read on the fall of Rome. Now, Looking back historically, and we think about and we see how much death and destruction Rome had caused, how much havoc it wreaked upon the church. And here, even fast forwarding, if you were to mark it in the 400s or even as late, you know, even maybe a little bit later of the fall, the actual fall of Rome, imagine all of the martyrs saying, yeah, the empire has been destroyed. The empire has fallen. That part of the empire that has not already converted. So there's kind of like a double win there, right? Because you have part of the empire that's converting to Christianity. But then the other part that has just completely collapsed, has been destroyed. And so there's that rejoicing. Now, what we, we read this, we understand it in the past, and we're looking ahead to the future of this culminating evil upon the earth. And that even though people, Christians, are being martyred all over the world today, that this could easily increase in intensity leading up to Babylon's destruction. And it's at that point that we see a broader chorus breaking out and rejoicing over that destruction. So so the series of three laments is followed by the adulation and worship of a new grouping of three. First, we hear the heavenly multitude, verses 1 through 3. As they raise their voices to extol the salvation, glory, and power of God. His judgment on the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth and her adulteries is true and just. Next, we hear the 24 elders and the four living creatures in verse 4 as they cry out, Amen, Hallelujah. And finally, a voice from the throne in verse 5 invites those on earth to join the mighty chorus of praise to God. So that is the three part. So in response to the three dirges of the last chapter, here we have three responses, three praises. So reading verse, any questions before we get started? Any questions even of the previous Good to go? Everybody awake? All right. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. So here we have the great multitude in heaven praises God for judging the prostitute and avenging the blood of the martyrs. Many writers understand this multitude to be an angelic host. So that's one option. Others believe it to be made up of the faithful dead. Not grateful. (laughs) Some of you are already thinking it. Come on. Low-hanging fruit. Okay. All right. (laughs) Made up of the faithful dead. The... uh, Boy, there's a spoof there somewhere, right? You can, no, all right, all right. So the specific mention of salvation, as in chapter 7, verse 10, and the concern for avenging the blood of the martyrs, as in chapter 6, verse 10, make it more likely that they are the church triumphant. 
of chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, and 13 through 17. So let's go to chapter 7 real quick. Starting at verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, and every nation, and all tribes, and peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And then jumping to 13, Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they? And where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Isn't that kind of neat to like be in 19 and to kind of go back and read from 7? And to kind of see like, oh, these are the ones who have just been through everything that we read in the last like six chapters. Just how circular this is. So the word hallelujah occurs only in this passage in the New Testament. So when we read verse, when we read hallelujah in verse 1, three, four, and six. This is the only place in the New Testament that the word hallelujah actually appears. So the fourfold hallelujah in chapter 19 is the only time this appears in the New Testament. It is derived from two Hebrew words, halal and yah, which means praise Yahweh. We covered that last time, right? And that was the only thing some of you had picked up from last time. That was the, the aha moment. I was like, that was it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, you know, it's funny. It was like, it was, it was an afterthought. I was at the very end of the class, right? Like, talk for two hours and just drop a little nugget for 30 seconds. Like, oh! <gasps> oh! <gasps> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Take it where you can get it. So, so the Hebrew form introduces a number of psalms. So Psalm 106, 111 to 13, 117, 135, 146 to 150, and is regularly translated, praise the Lord, Lord, all capital letters. So let's go to 106, just Psalm 106, just to illustrate this and you can't go wrong reading a song don't worry we will not read the whole song <laughs> somebody's already looking at it like hey wait a second there goes the class all right so psalm 106 verse 1 it says praise the lord does everybody have praise the lord no mine says hallelujah oh good and then it says uh what version csv okay yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So Holman Christian um, reinserted Yahweh in some passages and tried to stick with, like, including some of the more common Hebrew words. So, nice. Um, anybody else? Does everybody else have praise the Lord? Lord all caps? Okay, and so what we've talked about before, Lord all caps is the actual name of Yahweh. And so for one reason or another, they chose not to actually have the name Yahweh, uh, but to have, you know, insert Lord, all caps, to signify that. So this psalm actually starts with, like with the CSV, hallelujah. Most of us have that first line translated, praise the Lord. So, 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's praise you, Lord. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, well, there you go. So, anytime you see that, you know, throughout Scripture, just know that, like, in the Hebrew, that would have been hallelujah. So, so you know some Hebrew. So, all right. Um, so, salvation, glory, and power belong to God. Salvation is more than personal deliverance. In this context, it refers to the safeguarding of God's entire redemptive program. So it's basically the second part of verse 1 here. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. So what we're saying is that it's not just in an individual sense, but it's in the collective. It is speaking of the entire redemptive program of God. It belongs to Him. Glory and power follow and refer respectively to the majesty and might revealed in effecting a deliverance of such magnitude. Which, think about that. I mean, even just from the cross forward, 2,000 years of those who have put faith in this redemptive work of Christ, that salvation is given to them. And not to mention just every other working, whether it be of the Spirit moving and transforming an individual's life, but also their enlistment within the kingdom, and furthering in you know, the kingdom by sharing the good news and living a life like what Adam was talking about this morning of those good deeds, right? Of representing Christ here on the earth. That's what this is all about. That is what we are a part of. So, definitely worth the hallelujah, right? Verse 2, because his judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. So, there you go. Yeah, so anytime you see that font, you just kind of look to the, uh, you know, if you have a cross-referencing section there, then you can look to that and... And, you know, and some of those verses aren't just from the direct quotation, but even also wherever else they're referenced. So that's kind of fun. Um, okay, so the outburst of praise rests upon the fact that the judgments of God, specifically his judgment of the great harlot, are both true and just. That God's actions are true indicates that they are valid. The punishment that the prostitute Rome has received is precisely what she deserved. It is also just. That is absolutely fair. The same two attributes are ascribed to God by the victors in chapter 15, verse 3, and by the voice of the altar in 16.7. So let's go to 15.3. It says, And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. And then in 16.7, And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God the Almighty, True and righteous are your judgments. So following the sound of the seventh trumpet, it was announced that the time of judgment had arrived. That's in chapter 11, verse 18. With the fall of Babylon, that judgment is underway once again. We hear the grounds on which the judgment of the prostitute is based. She has corrupted the earth by her adulteries and has murdered the servants of God. So she has 
corrupted the earth with her immorality. And has murdered the servants of God. For reference, we can jump back to 18, looking at verse 23 and 24. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer, and the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. So, pretty heavy. Um, Constant reference to her corrupting influence on the kings of the earth stresses the extent of her guilt. Her adultery is her seductive and unholy alliances with the entire civilized world. We talked extensively about that over the last couple of weeks. In the final clause of the section, the multitude in heaven declares that by the utter destruction of Babylon, God has avenged on her the blood of his servants. This is a concern that has run throughout the entire revelation. The martyrs under the fifth seal asked God how long it would be until he avenged their blood. Chapter 6, verse 10. The blood of the saints and or prophets is mentioned in chapter 16, verse 6. Chapter 17, verse 6. As well as chapter 18, verse 24. Early in the history of Israel, God was portrayed as one who avenges the blood of his servants and takes vengeance on his adversaries. So early in the history of Israel, God was portrayed as one who avenges the blood of his servants and takes vengeance on his adversaries. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43. Let's go there. We're making up for lost time because over the last chapter, there wasn't a lot of Old Testament reference, right? It was just three dirges. And so, (laughs) although there is Ezekiel 27, but you know, still. Deuteronomy 32. Verse 43. So this is the song of Moses. Hopefully everybody can have this memorized before heaven. Just kidding. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, For he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. Uh, Verse 43. That's uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 43. Since God is by nature absolutely just, it becomes necessary for evil to be punished in a moral universe that God will vindicate those who gave their life rather than betray their faith is absolutely certain. How do you feel? I mean, yeah, do do you feel like we live in a moral universe? No. (laughs) Yeah. That seems like that classic thing, why do good things happen to bad people? That's right. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely part of it, right? Yeah. And we always think we're the good people. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and that's, that's the thing is, um, yeah, the whole concept of the moral universe and just understand, because what we're reading here is all things being made right with the destruction of evil. And that's going to continue here even in this chapter and in the next with some finality. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge for us because as we're reading this, and we read this in a devotional manner, as it would have been handed to each of the believers or to each of the house churches. And they're hearing this. They're like, hey, wait a second. 
Am I perpetuating the system of the harlot? Am I a part of it? And that's what we talked about with the kings and the merchants and even the, those who were part of the transport. At what level am I perpetuating the evil on the earth or does it stop with me, at least in this little section, this avenue of it? And that's a challenge for every believer because how many avenues of society do we have represented just in this room? In a collective sense, what force can we make for the kingdom while we're here on the earth? Instead of perpetuating maybe some of the evils that we see all around us that maybe, just maybe, we've accepted over the course of our life. We've been trained to accept because, oh, well, that's a necessary evil. Have, we, have you ever heard that? Or, oh, that's just how things are. Or, I don't want to be rude. Oh, Midwest, stepping on toes. <laughs> Feels, yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, Adam did an amazing job. I mean, it's 25, 30 minutes, right? A lot better than a couple hours. I don't even know. Ephesus might have been two weeks worth. I'm not sure. I can't remember. It's, it was, that was so long ago. But um, no, I mean, just a couple of things that he captured was just, I mean, that was Jesus's correction was like, you've lost your first love. Yeah. And just really getting back that joy, the joy of our salvation, the joy of being in the Lord. Um, and I was thinking about that. I was like, you know, and especially I was thinking about Sunday night seminar um, for all of us who have just <coughs> dedicated to studying the word of God for hours at a time. And it's like, are we just filling our heads or are our hearts and minds being conditioned so that we are living differently? Like, that's why we do this. That's, that's, why, like, that's why I love going through it, and I'm always, I'm always happy when people show up to, to go through this with me, right? And it's just a matter of, like, like, how are we being changed by encountering God through His Word? And it's not a matter that we have to stay, like, in that, the newness of coming to Christ. Because really, there's a certain level of ignorance there. We're just like happy, you know? It's like, it's like you know, whether you're going to, to Disney or, or uh, Kings Island or whatever, and then you realize you got to walk everywhere. <laughs> and stand in lines and carry everything. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, but like, but then that's part of the joy of getting to see everything. And yeah, you've got to put some work into it. Nothing happens just for free, right? And that's part of this too. Is that like, yeah, salvation's a free gift. And then later on, you figure out that free, especially like the whole gift that Paul talks about, that word free, like there were no free gifts. It was an exchange. As Christ laid down his life, as it was a sacrifice, you are accepting it as you have laid down your life, as you have sacrificed yourself to take on Christ. That's the exchange. So, oh, the free gift of salvation. And then people fall away because they're not actually living it out, not pressing in, and to reap the benefit, the blessing of following Christ. But then for those who walk with Him, who step out in faith, who make those changes, who embrace the transformation that the Spirit brings, that God wants to bring upon us, we reap that blessing. We just have to like be willing to let go, sacrifice ourselves. And at some point, and Adam totally covered this this morning, we get comfortable. 
we get lax, we get distracted. But that same newness, that same transformation that God wanted to do at the beginning, He wants to continue until your last day. And that's when the transformation just gets into hyperdrive. That's the beauty of it, right? Whether you're waking up in heaven or in the resurrection itself. So we just, we have so much to do. We have so much that we, when we stay focused on Christ, like that's when the adventure begins. And some of us have tasted that, right? And so as we learn, as we grow more in the knowledge of God's word, it should facilitate. It should be like the guardrails for the transformation of our hearts and minds, of our lives. Because it's not all just like willy-nilly by the Spirit or by indigestion or whatever else, and it leads you just off into whatever else. Because some people go that route. Oh, I feel like I need to do this, and I need to, you know, whatever. Well, wait a second. How does that line up with God's Word and what transformation looks like in God's Word? So once again, like just the value of growing in that knowledge. But not just to leave it there, not just to like take a test, not just to be others down with it, but so that we can be transformed and transformed in a Christ-likeness that we know is grounded in the Word of God. That's how all this comes together. No, I, absolutely. And, you know, and that's always, I mean, that's the question is, like, when you're sharing the gospel with somebody, it's like, what all do you share at once? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and that, that's, that's the whole idea for discipleship, is that it's not just one conversation. And you don't have to make the quick sell. It's probably better that you don't. <coughs> It's probably having those regular conversations so somebody knows what they are committing to. And they trust you. Yeah, absolutely. And we're sharing our own journey with them. Not done. Not done. Well, yeah, and that's, that's the whole idea of transformation, right? Uh, you know, and we can't just walk up to somebody and be like, Repent, <laughs> you sinner! You know, like, I mean, that's why, like, I mean, when we're talking about it, when we talk about repentance, the context for that is not just scripture. It's our lives. We're sharing of ourselves. We're sharing that, hey, like, I'm still working out my repentance. Two and a half decades into this. So, but here's the things when I first came to Christ that I was convicted of and knew I needed to change, there was just a whole lot of other things I didn't know I needed to change. So, like, I, you know, there's, that's, that's the whole idea of discipleship is that we're having open and honest conversations. And we do this, we do this, whether we're trying to sell a hobby, we're doing this when at work, we're doing this in just basic relationships. Friends, all over the place. But all of a sudden, we get cold feet, and we're just like, I don't even know how to do this in a religious sense. But really, like, our faith should guide all of those areas. Right? That's that, like, just, just a little salt, a little grace, a little salt, Right? speech. See the salty shirt there? That's right. That's right. <laughs> and that's how, like, you know, it's just kind of like, we're, we're just fishing, seeing who wants to take that bait. We can have those conversations. Let's do it three. All right, moving on to three. So, oh, actually, no, we were going to read uh, 19, uh, Psalm uh, 19, 9. So that is referenced here. All right, Psalm 19. It 
So just the reference, his, because his judgments are true and righteous. So 19.9, the fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true. They are righteous altogether. And then as we jump down, uh, Deuteronomy 32.43, uh, which we already read, uh, is the reference for has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. So that is the reference to the Song of Moses that we read. Does anybody else have uh, another translation there in verse 9 of chapter 9, Psalm 19? Mine says pure. Pure. Okay. Yeah. The fear of Yahweh is clean or pure, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true. They are righteous altogether. Uh, but even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. <laughs> uh, let's see here and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe so john writing that um, about his gospel like testimony so nice uh that that's a real it's a really good uh that's a good one from jesus there and like i mean here we are with like Christ exacting, being the instrument of God's judgment. Well, and it's interesting that it's John writing this, and then that was John too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, verse three. And the second time they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. So once again, the heavenly multitude lifts its voice to, in praise to God. The second hallelujah is not simple repetition, but a sort of heavenly score that heightens measurably the dramatic quality of the scene. If the second and in verse 3, which is often omitted by the NIV, is a Hebraism that introduces a circumstantial clause and not a mere conjunction, then the clause that follows supplies the reason for that for, it, for that praise. Okay, so as the Hebrew is structured, if it's an and right there, what is to follow is going to be the reason for that praise. So, namely, the smoke of her burning rises forever and ever. So this isn't a second praise for what we read in verse 1 and verse 2. This is the second hallelujah is about her smoke rises up forever and ever. Man. So John's readers would perhaps recall the oracle of Isaiah against Edom in which the enemy's land is to burn night and day and its smoke will rise forever and ever. So let's go to Isaiah 34. Oh, man. <laughs> Isaiah 34, verses 8 uh, through 10. For Yahweh has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its streams will be turned into pitch, and its loose earth into brimstone, and its land will become burning pitch. It will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will go up forever. From generation to generation, it will be desolate. None will pass through it forever and ever. Woof. So that was Isaiah 34, verse 8 through 10. All right. So verse 4. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, 
Amen. Hallelujah. So in chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Actually, let's go ahead and let's read that for ourselves. Chapter 5, verse 6 through 10. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So when the Lamb took the scroll from the right hand of God, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before Him and sang of His worthiness to open the seals. Once again, they join in the same act of worship, this time honoring God for His righteous judgment. This is their last appearance in the book of Revelation. Their words, Amen, Hallelujah, echo the close of the doxology that marked the end of, the bo of book 4 of the Psalter. Psalm 106, 48. Let's go there. Psalm 106. Psalm 106, verse 48. So it's not just the end of that psalm, but book four of the psalms. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, from everlasting even to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen, Hallelujah. So we should say Hallelujah instead of praise Yahweh or praise the Lord, uh, and let all the people say, Amen, Hallelujah. So, that's one of those things that like once you, once you know that, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so from now on, whenever you're reading the Old Testament and it says, praise the Lord, Lord, all capital letters, you'll be like, hallelujah. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so this is the last appearance of the four living creatures. Here in verse four, uh, and the 24 elders. So... So, all right, verse 5, because we are making progress. <laughs> and a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. So in verses 1 through 3, the redeemed in heaven sing out the praises of God. In verse 4, the heavenly court responds, Echoing its affirmation, now the church on earth is invited to join in. The voice that is heard from the throne calling upon all the servants of God to praise Him is probably that of one of the heavenly beings who surrounded the throne. It's not the voice of God, nor is it the voice of the Lamb, who would have said, my God, rather than our God. An example of that is chapter 3, verse 12 as well as John 20, verse 17. Nor are there servants of God a limited and select group, such as the glorified martyrs, but as the two following phrases indicate, the entire group of faithful believers, you who fear him, both small and great, are believers on earth from every socioeconomic level and represent every stage of spiritual maturity. Kind of goes along with what you're saying. The call is directed to the church on earth because it wouldn't make sense to admonish those in heaven to praise him, for that is what they were just doing in verses 1 through 4.
I'm just looking to see if anybody's uh, eschat esch eschatology just got wrecked. Be like, wait a second. I thought all the believers had already been raptured up and weren't on the earth. But anyways, we'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> It could appear to some that rejoicing over judgment is something less than a Christian response. So we've touched on this once or twice. Should the destruction of a mighty city and its effect upon all who do business with it be the cause of universal rejoicing? The answer is that it is not the actual suffering of those who are punished that brings rejoicing on the part of the redeemed, but the fact that God has vindicated his cause in the world. Nothing less than the character of God is at stake. The one who promised the martyrs that their willingness to sacrifice their lives would not go unrequited, must of necessity bring judgment on their oppressors. Wow. Just think about that one. The redeemed shout hallelujah, not because tyrants are suffering, but because God has vindicated himself by bringing about the punishment they deserve. That's a pretty important sentence. I think so. I mean, just think about, obviously none of us have experienced this, but you think about martyrdom. What are you what would you give your life up for? In what context would you give up your earthly life for the cause of Christ? And not just a, you know, gun to your head, do you believe in Jesus or not? You know, if you say yes, you know, you're done. But Something less dramatic. Even just maybe being known as a Christian in Rome, knowing that you could get arrested, picked up, and thrown into a Colosseum. Because, you know, they were looking for uh, more fodder for, you know, food for the lions and stuff. Entertainment. Yeah, for entertainment, right. You know, so, so what does... Yeah, what does martyrdom look like? Do you think about vindication? Is eternity enough vindication? We, we don't talk about martyrdom very much, do we? Do we see it as a... Because you know, we all know, we all know that we're saved. But do we see it as that 100% guaranteed golden ticket that we're in? <clears throat> what does martyrdom look like? And, you know, and if that is something that you're moving up towards, moving towards, like what happens with laying down your life on a daily basis? Because... Because death it happens to be that end of all those earthly plans. That's what you're sacrificing. That's why, that's why we mourn at funerals, right? Is it's, it's what could have been, what would have, the interactions, productivity, the influence, the, all these other things that happen, that could have happened with the life. And maybe that's why we make the death of the young so much more tragic than someone who is 105. It's like, oh, they, they've lived a full life. They're still dead. <laughs> <laughs> Their time's up, you know? That was, that was a lot of earthly wisdom that just ended. <clears throat> this one still needs someone to change their diapers. <laughs> Reference Adam's sermon this morning. And so, you know, it, it's one of those things that like, what does laying down our life entail? And even bringing to the point of martyrdom, and even looking at, like, God vindicating himself by bringing judgment on the systems of the world, 
that facilitated the martyrdom of believers, of Christ followers. Paulo, do you have something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish everybody could have just seen that grin from Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't be looking for it, right? Exactly. Absolutely. So I, when I, oh boy, I was probably here for maybe like, I was on staff for a couple of years and was, you know, doing baptisms and everything. And there was an article in Christianity Today. Um, this was a long time ago for Christianity Today. But they had a really amazing article on believers in the Middle East. And part of their questions of, you know, like when somebody wants to profess faith in Christ and as they are getting baptized, they ask, like, will you embrace um, being separated from your family for them to like kick you out and for you to be on your own? And, you know, and the person's responding, yes, I accept that. Will you like... At gunpoint, will you deny Christ when your life is on the line? And they say, no, I will not deny Christ. And I mean, you know, just going through this whole list of questions of like walking these, like, just so you know, what is at stake here? You will be ostracized from your family, from your community, from all these areas of your life. Your life as you know it could be over. And literally speaking, you could lose your life over this commitment that you're making today. We're not asked that. <laughs> We're not asked that. It's a totally different context. Right. Yeah. And we're talking about this for us to understand, just to even like try to get a little bit of a glimpse or a grasp on why God can vindicate himself by bringing his wrath on the system that facilitates this martyrdom. Wholesale. We're not just talking about one person. We're talking about systematically trying to, to, to see Christianity, to see followers of Christ as a disease on society and that they're trying to like root that out. Just from what I've read, I mean, you know, if you talk, if you want to talk about the Japanese, World War II, like they were fighting for their emperor. I mean, they believe that there were, you know, he was divine. They were, I mean, they were dedicated to the cause, and that was bred in them their entire life. Was I mean, and that's something that we just don't have any we don't even have a grasp of like just that level of loyalty and dedication to country to a person as the emperor and to just yeah being willing to lay down your life and that's without even you know just coming from like a shintoism like that just that is without this deep faith in the afterlife, a better world to come, you're just hoping that your ancestors, your, your descendants, will offer sacrifices and <laughs> to, to, you know, leave food at a shrine to you. I, mean, I, I, I think... I, the four brothers that died in World War II. Sure. I, I think that the U.S., instead of dying for people, or like a leader or something like that, like what has been bred into us, driven into us, is like ideals, principles of liberty and freedom. And that's what, like, from start to, you know, whatever, uh, like that is what we want for ourselves and for others. Now, okay, I'm, I'm just going to stop right there before, like, I go off into something else but um but i think like the idea of over the course of history what have people given up their lives for right and 
most immediately, it's, per, you know, honor, right? So much of the world has grown up in an honor-shame culture. And so that's not even just giving up your life, but that's also taking somebody else's. Um, protection of family and resources. Resources thereby tying into the status or health of your family. Um, you know, and then, yeah, country and... But then also dying for your country also brought about honor for your family. So once again, just the honor, shame, you know, that ties into it. So, yeah. but... Well, and let's remember that the original, you know, in the Greek, the word well, that we have martyr is witness, right? So Stephen, the first martyr, was a witness to Christ. He was a witness to all of those that were stoning him <coughs> of the power of Christ. Was that the first year use of the word martyr in the Bible? Uh, offhand, I, I don't want to tell you wrong. Uh, I could look that up, but so. Yeah. So. Maybe. Oh, well, sorry, we'll pick it up right now. Yeah, somebody's, right, yep, <laughs> look it up. <laughs> so. So all that to say, uh, here in the first uh, five verses, you know, we are seeing the hallelujahs for the judgment that God has brought on the harlot, on the beast. So, first mention. Okay. So. Praise, praise the Lord. That's... Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I accept that. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. All right. Moving on here. Verse six. <laughs> so the final victory. That's kind of the name for the section that we're about to start. And that's basically chapter 19, verse six all the way to chapter 20, verse 15. The final victory. So once again, just reading from Mounts, we come now to the scenes depicting the final victory of God over Satan and the forces of evil. The fall of Rome in chapter 18 is a picture of the eschatological demise of every proud human institution that glorifies, that glories in its accomplishments at the expense of all that is right and good. In the end, God's righteousness will prevail. Following the ecstatic praise of God for his just punishment of the prostitute, we are told that at last the time for the wedding supper of the Lamb has come. The church, as the bride of Christ, will at last be united forever with the Lamb. The realization that this long-awaited day has come overpowers John, who falls to his knees in worship. This remarkable section of Revelation, which begins with an announcement of the marriage of the Lamb, which is chapter 19, verse 6 through 10, leads on to the return of Christ as Messianic conqueror, chapter 19, verse 11 through 16, the final destruction of the Antichrist and his allies, chapter 19, verse 17 through 21. The binding of Satan, chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. The millennial reign, chapter 20, verse 4 through 6. The end of Satan's regime, chapter 20, verse 7 through 10. And then the great final judgment, chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. As the visions follow one after another, they leave an ever-deepening awareness that God really is in control and that righteousness will reign eternally supreme. Whew, that was a lot, huh? But that's, that's where we're going. Here in verse 6 to chapter 20, verse 15, when we talk about the end times, this is what a lot of people talk about. This is what they think of, right? The end with Jesus' return, his reign, 
uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Maybe you've heard some of these things tossed around and never actually read these verses. This is what we're getting into right now. So, all right. So in verses 1 through 3, a heavenly multitude praised God for his judgment of the prostitute. Previously described in chapter 17 and 18, verses 6 through 8, they rejoice that the wedding of the Lamb is at hand. This change of perspective suggests a new division in the narrative. Although the Greek text sh shows no specific break before verse 6, the context indicates that we are entering into a new phase in the eschatological finale of Revelation. The previous hallelujahs, chapter in verse 1, 3, and 4, pointed back to the destruction of Babylon in chapter 18. The hallelujah of verse 6 points forward in anticipation of the coming wedding of the Lamb. So the bride in this joyous wedding is the church. She wears a wedding garment of fine linen, the righteous acts of the saints. An angel tells John to write that those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb are indeed blessed. Overcome with grandeur of the scene, John falls at the feet of the angel to worship him, but is stopped by the angel with the reminder that he too is simply a fellow servant of those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Which we'll get to a couple of these, uh, of an interesting note on John falling at the feet of the angel. Uh, we'll come up on that. It's, it's kind of interesting. So, all right. Any questions before we get into verse 6? Are we moving too fast? Do we need a big rabbit trail? <laughs> All right. Verse 6. Here we go. Are you trying to miss it all night? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying... Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. So the sound that John hears is like the sound of a great throng of people, like the roar of a mighty cataract, and like a great peal of thunder. So such high drama is appropriate for the announcement that God has at last established His, univer his universal reign on earth. While the universal and timeless sovereignty of God is assumed in Judeo-Christian thought, it can be said to be established on earth in a special eschatological sense when the powers of evil are destroyed and the kingdom of God becomes a visible reality. Everybody tracking on that? God reigns supreme, but here on the earth, who has been given to rule it in this time? Satan. Satan. And we're surprised when bad things happen. I feel like it's like the Job story. Yeah. God's like, okay. <laughs> well, and, and that's the thing, like, and, and it's stories like that that, you know, can help shape and understand, and that's why it's there. But yeah, like, like we've all switched sides. We're in enemy territory. And that goes back to Adam and Eve. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, that's the whole nature of the fall. When we came to Christ, within this enemy territory, like we have committed to the king who is coming, who is not here. When he was here, they killed him. Only for him to come back to life three days later to repeal the curses of death and sin. And to give us hope of a, a resurrection to come. He has only as much power over us 
as we give him. Even as Christians, even as believers. Because, because that's us participating. How much are we tempted? How much do we give in to the temptation? To be his pawn in furthering the cause of evil. In the same way, how much do we give our allegiance to Christ and allow the Spirit to work in us to further the kingdom of God? Like, that's what neutralizes our testimony. That's what renders us powerless. The, we have no power on our own. It's only when we yield to Christ. Now, I mean, he was encouraged, curse God and die. <laughs> but he wasn't going to. And, and you know, when, when this is opened up, he's offering sacrifices on behalf of his family just in case they sinned. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, so righteous in every way. And so, I mean, he was kind of this, this beacon, this light. So much so that he gets attention from God and Satan. <laughs> nice. And that was what the pre-K was learning this morning. Amen. There you go. We've all been blessed by the pre-K lesson. So too bad you can't be there. You got to sit in big church. So, <laughs> well, maybe, well, maybe to bring <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, but that's awesome. I mean, you know, because that's framing life, right? And how do we talk about what we experience in life? And how do we pass that along to our kids and grandkids and great grandkids, to our friends, to our to the people who aren't even familiar with a Christian worldview? I mean, a lot of times we just say God's in control and we just stop right there. And so then all these bad things happen. They're just like, wow. At least I know who to hate now. I mean, that's really where we leave the world thinking. Instead of maybe having a deeper theology and understanding. I mean, because think about some of the things that we've already talked about tonight. How many people would be shocked to hear that? To wait, 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 wait. Satan's in control. I thought God was in control. Yeah, and yeah. Like, it's a both and situation here. It's just temporary on this side. I mean, they might be surprised. No, I mean, you know, because a lot of times Satan is just portrayed as a troublemaker. No, he is the prince of this world. Like, this is his playground. And he is upset. He is angry because his time is short with every passing moment, with every day. And what we're going to get to at the end of this chapter and into the next chapter is where he ends up. And he knows this place. And this is not his home. He doesn't like, like, crank the heat up to 100, right? Like, he doesn't want that. It's a place of punishment that has been designed for him. So he does, like, hell is not his home. He doesn't just want to, like, hang out there. When he goes, this entity that we refer to as Satan will suffer and be destroyed. The one who has stirred up the nations that caused so much trouble from the beginning will experience pain and suffering unrivaled to anything else that we could ever imagine. You got me. Well, and it's just understanding we live in a fallen world. We live, like, because of the fall, we have sickness and death. Like, there's a natural degeneration to our bodies, right? Especially post-flood. Like, God's like, I'm not going to deal with these people past 120. <laughs> it's just not happening. <laughs> Previous generations, like, we're going hundreds and hundreds of years. No, no. 120, we're moving this plan along. <laughs> <laughs> 
and, and which really <laughs> it might just be how I see things, but you're like, oh yeah, this totally makes sense. We got this trial run before eternity. We're not just jumping into eternity. Let's like, let's give everybody a shot first. This is the tryouts before we get to eternity. Who is going to live in enemy territory devoted to a king that they've never seen? To represent and to further a message and to live differently than what we've ever believed and taught in our lives because of the testimony of the word of God and because of the deposit of his spirit within us. That's what this is all about. So we've been saved to save others so that we can all go into eternity together to live for eternity with our Savior. Well, and a lot of times, one, it's just it's because we've not communicated an accurate worldview. And two, we just don't, we just don't wrestle with those things. We don't wrestle with death and we give little cliches instead of like, yeah, that's horrible. Let, me, let us mourn together over that. But also know that this isn't what God wanted either. And that is not a challenge of his control. It's because things have been set in motion, laws, if you will. And this is also, I think, something that C.S. Lewis did a masterful job with the Chronicles of Narnia. Like that there were rules that could not be broken. And that it caused certain, there was like, you know, a, a series of things that had to happen and happen a certain way, right? And that's, that's what we're all living in. That's why sickness and death is still around from the beginning, because Adam and Eve chose to rebel and sin entered the world. Like we read it, it's just like this cute little story, but it's conveying this idea that like we wanted to be like God. Like, that's the ironic piece of this. And in our attempt to be like God, we open the floodgates to sin, the knowledge of good and evil. And with that entered death and sickness. And yeah, so, so there is no guarantee of a certain number of years for any life. And so that's why people, you know, that's why babies die. That's why, you know, the young or at the peak of life or strength or whatever else, like there's just, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Except the reason is that it goes back to the fall. We don't go back to that enough and really understand that like, and when we do, when we meditate on those things, we understand how much every day is a blessing. And not a blessing for our own selfishness, but an opportunity for us to serve and to further the kingdom of God. That's staying focused. Because once again, if we get distracted by all the things of this world, remember who's the prince over this world, we get distracted by those things. We've just come full circle in frivolity. What are we working towards? Are they eternal things? Now, there's things that we have to do in this life that kind of keep our lives going, right? But I think it's also a matter of challenging the systems that we belong to. What do we actually need in life? What does our testimony look like at this point in history? So when we understand the effects of the fall and how much of a blessing every moment is for us to be alive and bring this chance of life and to be agents of the creator of the universe. Renouncing our allegiances to the prince of this world. 
praying for insight on how can we be agents of the kingdom here now in enemy territory. It changes things. It changes our relationships. It changes the things that we do in our own time, our off time. It changes our identity. It even rewrites our identities of pain from the past. Yeah, so Paul talks about this. I mean, it comes up a few different places that God tests us. He doesn't tempt us. James unpacks that. Yeah, we're absolutely tested to see where our loyalties lie. And God knows all the buttons to push. That temptation, though, that doesn't come from God. That's, that's what's bubbling to the surface. Right? A lot of times we want to know the whole plan because, because we want to be God. We want to be in control. We want to sit in judgment of the current plan. Because <laughs> we don't like it. We don't like how this part ended up. So, oh, that's part of that sacrifice is just yielding that control. And <laughs> Oh, man, look at that. Okay. Uh, well... Uh, let's see. Let me finish reading this note on six, and so we can start with seven next time, okay? All right, so in the historical context of a proud and uh, powerful Roman Empire, for John to call God the Almighty is an act of extreme confidence. Domitian had conferred upon himself the title, Our Lord and God. Literally, the word means one who holds all things in his control. Nine times in Revelation, John uses it of God, while only once is it found elsewhere in the New Testament. The multitude declares that this all-powerful being who has entered into his reign is a personal God. He is the Lord, our God. So I don't want to skip right over, but John, who's in exile because of Domitian, nine times makes it known that Domitian is not the Lord our God. <laughs> and with that, we will wrap up right there and start with verse 7 next week.